<laughs> yeah, so at the end there will be again a demo from the back of the room if you want to do it. Yes, so if anything doesn't make any sense to you, uh, I will give a brief demo at the end. Uh, of course, I always like to layer in a demo as we progress, but since we're having technical difficulties, I'm not able to do that. So uh, I'm Michael Ducey. I work for a company called Chef. Uh, if you haven't heard of Chef, Chef runs uh, three open source projects. Uh, one is the original one that we got started with called uh, Chef. Uh, another one is called Inspec, uh, which is uh, created by some gentlemen over in Germany. Uh, and then the third open source project, which I'm going to talk about today, is one called Habitat, which helps you package up an application and then run that application in production. Uh, while I'm going through the talk, if you want to look at anything, uh, kind of find out more information about what Habitat is and maybe look up the documentation and other things like that, uh, feel free to take a picture of this right now, and then you can have useful links for you uh, as, so you can follow along. So uh, this analogy was made at uh, another conference uh, where it's kind of like the evolution of technology, right? So if you look at the broom, that's kind of how we used to do things manually. Bare metal systems in your own data center, you installed, you know, you put the ISO in, or the, I'm sorry, the DVD or the CD in, and you bootstrapped the machine and kickstarted it and all those fun things. Uh, and then we got a little bit smart about technology and we started having things like VMs, uh, and things like Chef and Ansible and Puppet and other stuff like that. And that's kind of the vacuum cleaner. And you get a little bit more automation, but you're still having to push it around manually and clean up. Uh, and then containers and container orchestrators are more like the Roomba, right? Where you just kind of set it free and it just goes and cleans everything up. And talking about the developer experience of uh, the Roomba or containers, uh, it's usually pretty positive, right? So that's the developer and you know, using containers, and that's enterprise IT, and enterprise IT is like, no, you can't be using containers, and the developers just get out of my way, right? And then you get a little bit more cocky as you go along, and you have some other people that are following you along, and maybe you find uh, some more technology that you layer into how you're using containers as well. And then what ends up happening is, is enterprise IT tries to emulate you, and they build the enterprise container orchestrator or something like that, right? Some god-awful, horrible name that doesn't do exactly what you want at all, right? So you're still over there. But the reality of what actually what you need to run containers effectively in production are uh, a little different from that first touch developer experience, right? And so this is, um, well, this is a dog. Uh, doing, how many people have dogs? Wow, not I have a dog, one other person. So for those of you who don't know about dogs, sometimes they don't always go outside. Uh, sometimes they go in your house. And you can see he's done that, or she's done that. Uh, and then he's also, or she's expecting, uh, or inspecting uh, what just happened. And this is important, so you should always look down and make sure there isn't blood or anything like that. Uh, colon cancer is a thing. Um, but then here comes the Roomba, and the automation's working the way the automation is supposed to be working, right? And the automation is kind of dumb to its environment. And of course, the Roomba sees a mess and wants to make sure that the mess gets cleaned up. And much like when you just blindly deploy containers into production, you now have shit rubbed all over your floor, right? So automation is great, and containers are great, and all of that. Uh, but there are concerns that you have to start to think about when you actually go and try and deploy them out into a production environment. And we kind of call this the learning cliff. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, you'll look at the thread of this uh, tweet and you'll see many people replying and saying, well, that's the same with any technology, right? It, that is true. It's the same with any technology is that you always have to read through the hype and you have to see where that cliff of despair is when it comes to trying to go and implement that in production, right? And the thing with containers is it makes you rethink, or not just containers, but any technological advancement, what happens is, is it makes you rethink the way you do a lot of the work uh, that you do 
today. And if you think of, if you were in the last talk in this track, the serverless tra uh, talk, it was very much like that. It was that you have to rethink how you do technology and your technological processes uh, around uh, how you deploy code. And it's gonna be different when you're using different technology. So one big thing that you have to remember is that when you're looking at containers is that containers aren't a VM, right? So we, uh, the very first talk in this track had kind of mentioned this idea, and there's a common, when you need to explain a container to somebody, typically what happens is, is well, it's like a little mini VM, but it's not, and don't run it that way, but you, know, you can think of it that way. But the worst thing that you can do is treat a container like a VM if you're actually gonna run it in production. And, you know, we like to say that containers aren't VM, but are we actually sure that that's actually what's happening in production? So uh, a guy by the name of Gareth Rushgrove, he runs uh, a weekly email mailing list called DevOps Weekly. Uh, he actually works for Puppet uh, over in Cambridge. But he did a study and he looked at a lot of different things. Um, and one of the things that he found is that 75% of containers uh, container a full OS, contain a full OS. I've done this talk before and I left that typo in there and I'm just kind of like angry at myself that I don't correct that typo. And then another study, I, I wanna say this was a Datadog study that Datadog just put out, is that the current usage uh, patterns show that uh, you're only getting about a four to one container to host ratio, right? So for every VM you spin up, you're gonna be able to run four uh, containers on it. So what are the two things that we can kind of guess off of those two statistics, what, how we actually run containers in production? Those are VMs, right? We're treating containers like VMs. There's no need to put a full operating system inside of a container anymore. Uh, you, all you need to do is package up your application. But it, the problem is, is that it's very easy to do the wrong thing from how the patterns that are out there, uh, especially the patterns and Docker files, uh, let you easily go and do things like this. So what have you just done? You've just pulled in practically a full operating system, right? Now, it's not a full operating system. Uh, over the years, the vendors have gotten better about minimizing as much as possible what's inside of these container images, but there's still a lot of stuff in there that you don't need. And then there's also still a lot of things in there that you do need that you're going to have to go and build and put in there yourself. And if you think of it, uh, there's now this movement called uh, modernized traditional applications that a vendor has that's very heavy in the container world. And when you just take a, con a, a VM and convert it into a container, all you're doing is lifting and shifting your technical debt. Right? You've taken all this old code and uh, configuration and other things like that, and if you just migrate it over, and we saw this in the cloud environment when we were doing um, virtual to cloud migrations. Uh, you also saw it when you were doing physical to virtual migrations uh, six to eight years ago, right? And you're taking with you all of those problems that you had inside of that VM and you're just turning it into a containerized format so that you can move faster, right? And you're actually not solving your problems. So let's talk about what modern applications mean, right? And this concept of modern applications and cloud native and the cloud native track, of course, is all about how do we run modern applications. So I'll, this is gonna be more operations focused because I'm a, 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 by background, I'm an operations and infrastructure person. And so when I talk about things and think about things, I'm talking about it more from the perspective of how do you actually run it at scale in production. Whereas uh, for a developer-centric crowd, you might all be thinking about, well, I just wanna get my code and throw it over the wall to ops, right? As quickly as I can. So let's talk about modern applications and what you need to run modern applications effectively. So modern applications need to start with this idea of API first. And you start with API first from a couple different perspectives. From the application itself, the first thing that you should design is having an API which people can communicate with your application. And then if you have a user interface, then the next thing you put on is that user interface on top of it, right? Same thing from an operations perspective as well. You wanna start with having an API to go and query that application for things like health, uh, reconfigure that application, and also standing up the services that that application need 
you want to take an API-first approach. And this is what cloud is all about, right? Cloud might seem complicated. There's lots of different definitions about it. Uh, but the main thing about cloud is being able to request compute resources over an API. And that's kind of the main common defining uh, uh, thing that you see over and over again in the cloud world, no matter if you're using infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or serverless. Uh, you need to minimize the area of concern, and we heard a couple talks about that today, and this idea of breaking, things, of breaking the monoliths up into microservices and having the smallest area of concern possible for your application. Uh, you want your application instances uh, to be ephemeral as much as possible, so you should be able to go in and kill one of those instances, and automation will bring it back up, and it will be able to pick itself back up and join its peers and figure out what the live running configuration is, and then bring the application up just like you would expect, right? And also, you should be able to bring up new instances for load, and once the load goes back down, you can kill off those extra instances because you don't need them anymore. And this should work for stateful applications where you're actually storing state uh, in a database or something like that, or stateless applications as well. And then you should focus on artifacts. So um, one realization that I had a few years ago, uh, I was actually in Amsterdam, uh, sitting on a day much like today outside on a terrace somewhere, uh, having a drink with a friend, and it talked about this idea that Everything is moving, everything in the technology world, all of our processes are moving towards this idea that everything is an artifact. And it's all about how you do artifact management. And so if you think of a container, it's just an artifact, right? And the thing, if you think of a VM, it's just an artifact. Uh, a VM image, it's just an artifact. Your application code, it's just an artifact. It's all gonna be dependent upon the size of that artifact and what you're including inside of that artifact. But you can use the same CI and CD type processes to push that artifact out into a production environment. So Habitat is built upon this idea, so kind of setting the stage for you in the container world. Let's talk about Habitat itself. So Habitat is built upon this idea of how do you run modern applications and how do you make it as easy as possible to build, package, and then deploy and run that modern application, uh, no matter the environment. So uh, Habitat has this idea of API first. So um, it has technology in it. When you package up the application, uh, that package has an API to it where you can query uh, the configuration of that package. So if there's things that you can change, you can get that information. You can also query the package itself to find out your dependencies and your transient dependencies. And then when you actually take that package to go and run it in a production environment, there's what's called the Habitat Supervisor. And the Habitat Supervisor allows you to do things, which I'll talk about more, to query the health of the running application, uh, to find out the running configuration, to find out about peers and other things like that as well. And I'll cover that here in a second. It focuses on artifacts. So the main uh, thing about Habitat is that everything's treated as what's called a Habitat artifact or a heart file. Uh, and when you package up any of your pieces of software, it's all about getting the right pieces together to actually build the running application. So when you build your ap application artifact, you're going to declare what your build time dependencies are and what your runtime dependencies are. And inside of that, then Habitat will figure out what everything it needs to pull in, not only from your dependencies, but also transient dependencies as well, and then package them all up into one package that you can then ship. And that could be in the form of a container or another piece, uh, uh, another artifact if you want to. Uh, it eliminates the operating system. So um, you, you might be thinking, well, you went off your list wrong, but this is actually reducing your area of concern and having the smallest area of concern as possible. So the main thing about Habitat is that you're no longer dependent upon operating system components and operating system libraries and other pieces like that. And that's often why you have that line that says from Ubuntu 12.04, because you need some version of glibc or some version uh, of software that Ubuntu is shipping in 12.04, right? And you have to pull that library in because you're dependent upon that library. Habitat eliminates that for you in that we essentially recompile the world and have that artifact available for you in an artifact repository. And I'll talk more about this here in a second. So 
we have this idea of what's called an operable application or uh, an operable application container. So it kind of boils down to these seven principles or seven ideas. So they should be isolated, so you should be able to make changes to it um, uh, or redeploy it without necessarily impacting others. And if you are impacting others, you can at least have a mechanism to notify them that you're making this change. Uh, the application itself, so the uh, application code yourself that you're shipping should be treated as immutable, right? And that's one of the principles of containers is that containers should be treated uh, as immutable artifacts. Uh, the thing is, is there's always going to be last mile configurations that need to get changed somehow, right? Uh, so if you look at the concept of 12-factor applications and 12-factor applications, if you don't know what 12-factor applications are, uh, go to 12factor.net and it'll give you the 12 principles of 12-factor applications, and it really overlaps very nicely with cloud native. Some people actually use the terms interchangeably. But one piece of the 12-factor idea is that you have to store environment configuration in the environment itself, because the application, when it comes up, it'll need to be able to reconfigure itself. There should be a common interface for monitoring health. Uh, you should rebuild all of the artifacts that you need from source. Uh, and there should be a common packaging technology that you can use for those artifacts that, that you have uh, rebuilt. And then there should be what's called runtime independence. So you should be able to take this package, you should be able to take the package and the supervisor or our component uh, in this idea of operable application containers, and you should be able to deploy it to any underlying server technology. Um, and the Habitat's principle is that you can take a Habitat package that you create and deploy it onto any x86 Linux-based operating system. It doesn't matter if it's running on a VM, bare metal, inside of a container, or so forth. It'll run and function the same. So let's get into more about the problems that Habitat solves. So the easiest way to think of Habitat is that it solves the build lifecycle of an application, and it solves the run lifecycle of the application. So it's almost uh, the dev and ops tool. Uh, don't say that I said it's a DevOps tool. It's a dev and ops tool. Um, so how many people have ever done this? How many people have built software, right? So this is your standard. Uh, we just downloaded an open source library off the internet or open source something off of the internet. Uh, it's most likely written in C or C++ if it's a low level library. And I do this, right? And um, it's going to fail, and why is it going to fail? Because I didn't CD into the directory, right? <laughs> there should be a CD right there. No, it's gonna fail because you probably don't have a dependency installed, right? You don't have some sort of headers that this package uh, uh, needs to actually go and compile itself, right? Uh, and then you go into this whole cycle of downloading yet another tarball, running through the same thing, discovering you're missing something else, and you're basically, you're walking your dependency tree, right? And so what Habitat does is actually hides all of this for you. So by default, when you uh, start writing a Habitat package, the default implementation is essentially uh, the build cycle for this, right? Now, you can also do other build cycles if you want as well. So this is really, might be a little hard to see, um, if you've ever worked with Java, then this might look familiar to you. So this is the build cycle for a Maven-based application, right? Uh, so you can see a lot of the same things. Clean, uh, you have test, you have package, you have compile, right? And this is the build lifecycle of an application. You have similar things for NPM as well, right? So NPM install, which lets you vendor all of the uh, modules that you need to actually go and run your application. Um, package as well, or publish, and so forth, right? So what Habitat does is it defines the build lifecycle, and I'll show this in the demo. Um, so the default implementation is C or C++. Uh, you can provide other implementations by providing what we call a scaffolding. And so uh, we have two scaffoldings right now. We're in the process of writing one for Go. Uh, we're in the process of writing one for Java as well, and I want to say there's at least uh, there's a Python one that we're actively developing as well. And so if you use the core scaffolding Ruby, then basically all you need to do is define one line in what's called your plan.sh file, 
and you're, it will override basically that default implementation and it will provide to you a standard Ruby implementation of a build lifecycle, right? Same thing with the node. Uh, you can explicitly declare your build time dependencies. Uh, and this is, this is nice because before there was multi-stage Docker files, you had to um, make sure that you, if you did an app git update and app git install and put stuff into that container, especially if it was like GCC or make or other things like that, then in the same line, the last thing you'd want to do is remove all those build tools that you needed or actually in a layer down, you might want to remove all of those build tools. Uh, Habitat by default will not pull in build time dependencies um, because it gives you the ability to declare build time dependencies and then runtime dependencies separately for one another inside of this package. This will all become much more clear when I can show you a demo. So basically what Habitat is doing is it's kind of changing this triangle and turning this triangle upside down. So um, how many people still run Red Hat 5 in production? Four, six, right? Uh, you don't need to raise your hand. But a really old version of an operating system. And why do you run a really old version of an operating system? Well, because the IT group is like, this is stable, it's secure, we know what it is, we still get support for Red Hat. Um, but here's the problem. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that the operating system ships, and uh, the problem is, is they have a certain release cadence and a certain velocity that how quickly they can release things, right? And there are some applications in some people's environments that they made the decision when they deployed the application that they were gonna use the operating system vendor version of a library, and then from there on out, they're basically pinned hard to that operating system version and they can't go and update their operating system because they have all of these libraries that they need. Or, um, for example, uh, Red Hat 6 ships with uh, Ruby 187, right? And if you need a, a newer version of Ruby, uh, then you have to go and get it from uh, Apple, which is extra packages for enterprise Linux, or some other repository, or you have to go and build it yourself, right? So what the operating system provides, and especially in the container world, there's a lot of things that we don't need in here anymore, and it's just becoming a lot of waste. Uh, you don't need the kernel, for instance. Most of the user land that an operating system provides, you don't need either, right? And you see this when you look at technologies such as Google's uh, DistroList or uh, Basel, where it's really trying to get rid of the operating system as much as possible from your containers. Well, Habitat does the same thing for you. So, um, what Habitat does is that it starts with the application. So when you go into that plan.sh and you've declared the dependencies, what will happen is, is when you say, I'm gonna package this up in a container format, what it'll do is it'll start with the application and then calculate its dependency tree. And then it'll take that and it'll put it into the container. It'll put the Habitat supervisor into the container and then it puts a small, lightweight OS, and it's not really a lightweight OS. It's BusyBox. It gives you the loser, user land tools. I almost said loser. <laughs> the user land tools that you need if you needed to get into the container and just do basic troubleshooting and other things like that, right? And the interesting thing is, is that because we're doing dependency resolution top to bottom versus this method from bottom to top, and you're layering on over and over and over again, in this method, you don't necessarily know what was put into all of the additional layers unless there was an explicit manifest that's kept track from layer to layer to layer, right? And there are toolings where you can, tools out there where you can actually go and see exactly what's inside of a container image. Um, but when you start from the application, you can automatically know that information because all you have to do is essentially calculate the dependency tree of the application, right? So the goal is, is that when you're building containers, you want to try and, and building a container for your application, what you want to try and do is you want to try and minimize the percent of the operating system or what's traditionally seen as the realm of the operating system inside of your container and have more of the application. So if you think of if your container is 100 megabytes, then you want to try and have most of that 100 megabytes be your actual application code that you need to actually run your application and your language runtime, right? 
Uh, and if you look at that, the, you know, the easiest way to do that is to have a statically linked binary with virtually no operating system, right? So if you're using uh, a language like Go or something like that, that allows you to do that. So what Habitat allows you to do is post-process packages. So once I've packaged up my application, I can export it in a few different formats, and it'll do that dependency resolution the way that I showed. It'll put all your, your application, your dependencies, so it would be your language runtime and whatever other things you might be dependent upon, the Habitat supervisor, which I'll talk about here in a second, and then also um, uh, the small, lightweight user land for you as well. So let's talk about what applications need to run. So let's talk about the uh, run lifecycle of the application and what Habitat provides there in the container world. So uh, you need things like the lifecycle events, right? So every application has a lifecycle on the run side as well. And those, run, those are things like starting the application, stopping the application, uh, doing health checks, reconfiguring the application, and so forth. Uh, you need environment-specific configuration as well, so uh, you know, you move from stage or for development into staging, into QA, into UAT, into production. What's one thing that's probably going to be? Well, I hope it's different for each one of those environments. You hear the story recently where um, the new person started, and he was going to set up his local dev environment, and in the instructions it said to use the production database string, right? <laughs> So that's one thing that's going to be different between every single environment, or at least it should, unless you work at that company. Um, so that, you know, a JD, JDBC connection string or a database connection stream and string is going to be the one thing that should be different between every single environment. Well, how do you get that configuration information in? The password should be different between all of those environments as well, the usernames and so forth. Um, so that environment level specific configuration information needs to somehow get injected into the application so that it can start correctly. Uh, it also needs knowledge of peers from time to time. So some applications need to know that I have three other members that are running that same application, right? Because they're passing information between them and so forth. And then the other thing that you need to know is knowledge of dependent services. So if there's a service that you rely on, you have to know how you can go and get that information about where that service lives, and then also basic information about that service, like maybe what IP address it has, what port it's listening on, um, maybe con connection information or anything like that as well. So what Habitat provides is it allows you, uh, so you create, you, the first thing you do when you get started with Habitat is you do have, plan, and knit. And it's going to create a bunch of scaffold, or not scaffolding, it's going to create a bunch of um, um, know, templates for you, I guess like you could say. I wanted to say scaffolding, but I don't want to confuse the terms. Uh, it'll generate a lot of stuff for you. Uh, it's much like in Rails when you, when you do the generate in Rails and it gives you all of the scaffolding that you need to start writing a Rails application. Except with Habitat, you don't go and delete half of it after you've run the command. You, you actually keep most of it around. Uh, and one of the things that it creates is the hooks directory. So inside of the hooks directory, all you have to do is write a shell script of how you start the application, a shell script of how you do health checks, uh, and all these other steps that you can do as well in the lifecycle of an application. Now, you don't have to do all of them. If you don't have that file there, then Habitat won't care. But then what will happen is, is when the Habitat supervisor starts the application, it'll run the appropriate things uh, to start it, and then if a file changes, if a configuration gets changed, then it can run the reload or reconfigure and so forth. So it'll take care of all those lifecycle steps for you automatically. Uh, it can also manage the configuration of your application as well. So uh, by default, you store config files in uh, the config directory, which will also get created for you. Uh, and then you can provide default values. So you just put any file that you need a configuration um, uh, generated for inside of that dot, or inside of the config directory. You use a templating, template, templating language called handlebars, and um, basically what will happen is, is when the application starts up, that template will get parsed, and any of those values will get replaced with either the default values or values that you've overridden. So you can get default values from your scaffolding or from uh, a default.toml file that you create, 
And then you can override values by either using environment variables. Uh, you can create what's called a user.toml and place it into a certain directory, and that will override it. Or you can also connect remotely to the supervisor and inject new configuration into what we call the ring. So that last one is actually kind of interesting because you can also get defaults when you bring up a new application instance. Um, and you can point that application instance at its peers, and then it can get configuration information from the peers and configure itself correctly based upon the live running configuration that's happening in your environment right now. And that's what we call a ring. So uh, the supervisor, basically every single application instance that you would be running uh, is running inside of a supervisor. So in the case of containers, when the container comes up, what's actually launched as PID1 is the Habitat Supervisor service, and then the Habitat Supervisor service starts any application uh, processes that you need, right? And then what will happen is, is you can bring up a second instance, and you say, my peer is this particular IP address. And then you bring up a third and a fourth, and they all come together to form what's called a ring. Uh, what we call, we also call these our service groups. And so with this service group, you can do things like uh, pass configuration information, like I already said. Uh, you can also encrypt secrets and put it onto the ring, and then the ring is the only one that can decrypt it because it's using uh, a, um, uh, asymmetric encryption. Uh, you can also do things um, like leader follower election, which I'll talk about here in a second. So that's how you can pass information and basically begin to do service discovery. You can also have rings talk to one another. So when you start the application, uh, there's the option to do a dash dash bind. And this dash dash bind, you basically say if you have a database, you would say database colon the name of the ring where it can get database configuration from. And then inside of your configuration files, you would just simply reference database dot and then the parameter that you need. And then what will happen is, is that configuration information will automatically come from that other ring, go into your configuration file and set up your database connection. Uh, correctly. So the other thing that you need is you need some knowledge. If you have peers of an application or an application service, you might need to have a certain topology that you launch in, right? Uh, so the one um, initializer, actually, we took that out. I need to update this slide. Um, but leader and standalone are what you can do right now. And what will happen is in leader is that um, the application instances will come up. If they don't have three application instances up, they'll sit there and wait until three. They've seen three come up on the ring. And then what happens is uh, an election takes place. Now, if you're curious about the technology that we use or the algorithm that we use, it's all on the habitat.sh website. If you go to the docs and talk about internals or look at the internals page, you'll see all of that information if you want to get into kind of the distributed system theory that we use here. Um, what will happen is, is in the configuration file, all you need to simply do is say, if I'm a leader, then do this, or configure myself this way. If I'm a follower, do this, or configure myself this way. And then based upon the results of the election, the configuration files will get generated correctly. So if you're running something like Redis or MongoDB, uh, then you can just have the appropriate configuration lines written into those config files. The application will start up in that right topology for you automatically. If the leader dies, what will happen is, is the ring will see that the leader died and uh, has went away. If there's enough members on the ring to have quorum, then it will go and do an election again and then bring the application back up. And that's why we have that suitability hook that you saw before, because in some cases when you're working and storing data, you need to know who is the one who's most current, uh, and that person should become, or that instance should then become the leader, and that's what the suitability hook is used for. Uh, it influences the elections. So, um, so we kind of call this idea self-organizing applications, uh, and so the typical pattern uh, that you see, uh, like a good example is if you've ever looked at Kubernetes, and if you ever looked at the Kubernetes guestbook application, which is kind of their demo application, well, the way they solve this leader follower problem is that they create, you create one container called Redis master, and it's hard-coded configuration to always be the master or the leader. And then it also has one called Redis follower, 
Uh, and that's hard-coded inside of there to actually always be the follower. And then you just bring up the uh, instances or the containers, right? And everything works fine. The problem is, is you're now managing two different configuration files for those two different containers. And while you know two isn't a hard number to manage when you start thinking about managing systems at scale, and if you're going to have 100 of these different types of uh, applications that you have to manage in this way, now you're managing a, a, a 200 Docker files instead of uh, 100 Docker files. And that starts to become, when you talk, think about optimizing processes, this is an area that you might want to optimize the process. So in our pattern is you create one container image. Uh, you launch those images with knowledge of peers, and the application will automatically self-organize. And I'll show you this here in a second. Um, and then uh, what you can do is that when that self-organization happens, you can notify other systems. So in the case of maybe Kubernetes, what you can do is you can then go and apply appropriate labels based upon the results of the election. And then Kubernetes can route traffic based upon labels that way uh, as a selector. So the other thing that the supervisors provide is a REST-based API to do things like query health and status. Uh, you can also debug the supervisor this way so you can see the results of an election that takes place. Um, and then it's also useful for, useful for external actors as well. So if you have a load balancer service, uh, then that load balancer service can be querying that endpoint uh, to get the health check back from the application. And if the application's failed, then it can remove that particular instance out of the load balancer pool and then go on its day. So to summarize before I jump into the demo, so uh, Habitat approaches containers differently because uh, we're looking at building it from building a container from the application's perspective, not from the operating system perspective, which is kind of the current methodology that's prevalent when you use a Docker file. Uh, you can export containers in a variety of formats, so uh, Docker ACI, a Mesos package, uh, or just an ordinary tarball if you want. Um, and then when you export that container, you automatically get built into it things like service discovery, configuration management, this health check API, and this support for doing different clustering topologies as well. So you get a lot of benefits uh, by building that container with Habitat than the traditional method of using Docker, uh, Docker files or JSON that ACI uses. And it's all open source. So uh, if you're looking for a new open source project to contribute, we'd love to have you. Uh, it's written in Rust. The main components are written in Rust, uh, but all of the plans are written in shell script. So uh, we chose shell because it's a pretty approachable language, and most people know shell uh, to some extent. Uh, so if you're getting started with a plan, which I'll show you here in a second, it's all going to be shell. You're going to use other languages as well. So if there's a certain interpreter that you want to use for the hooks, then you could use uh, Python, you could use Ruby, or any other interpreted language if you want to as well. Uh, so here are links. And then I will run to the back, and I'll give you a really quick demo. OK, so I actually have something I created earlier. But what I'll do is um, just go up a level. And let's just remove this application altogether and start from scratch. So I'm going to use Express. I'm just going to create a, a sample site. Uh, so if I go into the Expresso directory that I just created, you can see that I've got all the basics for an application, right, a Node.js application. So all I need to do now is do hab plan init. I'm going to pass it a few flags. and. It's created the Habitat directory, and you can see that it's ba created the basics that I need to get started with Habitat. So you can see there's a plan.sh, the default.toml configuration, and so forth. So I can open that plan.sh. And you can see that it fills out a lot of stuff for you. Uh, so if you were pulling down from source code, you would put, put where your source code is. 
a SHA sum as well, and then in the build lifecycle, it'll automatically go and pull down that package for you, check the checksum, extract it, and then go about building the application. So in this case, we don't need any of this because we're doing a pattern where basically the Habitat plan is going to live with my source code directly, right? So I'm going to delete everything we don't need here, which is a lot. And then I'm just going to put one line. I wish we chose a shorter name. <laughs> OK, and then it'll save this. Now, when you're building things with Habitat, you have what's called a Habitat Studio. And so how many people, well, uh, you, I, I'm, I can see your hands, but it, I won't take a poll, but uh, have you ever had the situation where uh, you do some development and then you send it over to somebody else and you're like, okay, let's deploy this application. And then there's something that you installed in your development cycle, uh, a library or something like that, that uh, when you ship that application, it's not on the staging machine or the other machines that you're trying to deploy to, right? The whole works on my machine ops problem now, right? So when you build things with Habitat, what you do is you build it inside of a studio. And it's really just a very basic environment that pretty much has nothing installed. Uh, it has the very basic user land that you need to get started. And then if you need to install anything, you install stuff via Habitat packages. So I can do hab package install core jq.static, because I'm going to need this here in a second. And what it did is it goes and it pulls it down from the Habitat depot and installs it for me. And then now that package is inside hab package core. And you can see the JQ static right there that I just downloaded. But what I want to do is I'm going to build that application. So I was in my application source code directory uh, and when I entered the studio. So that's going to be mounted up to slash source for me. So all I need to do is run build. And so you can see here what's happened is, is that uh, it's validating my plan, and then it's also realized that I'm using a scaffolding. So it starts to download all of the dependencies for my scaffolding. And you notice that I didn't explicitly call out a certain version or anything like that, so it's going to default to the latest version. Now what I could do is I could actually be very specific, and I could put a version number on there if I wanted to put on that version number, if I needed a very specific version of the scaffolding. Or if I needed a very specific version of my language runtime or of, of Node, I could also call that out as well. And then you notice that it's going and installing more things. And we'll also see at one point where it's actually going to go and run the NPM install. And it's downloaded all of the dependencies that I have, vendored them for me. And then in the end, it goes and creates this heart file. So if I look in results, you can see that it just went and created that. Now what I can do is actually start the application. So I don't have to export this as a container first before I actually go and run the application. Now I could if I wanted to, uh, but for time I'm not going to. And now if I run slog for supervisor log, you can see that it's actually went and it started up the application. So the application is running. So by default, what happens is, is the supervisor runs in the background inside of this studio. And then that way, you can get a very tight dev loop so you can bring up your application inside of the studio, get feedback whether if it's going to work correctly or the work the way you expect. And then you can just tear it down later and export it in the format that you want to export it in, whether it be a container or ship it to a VM or whatever. So I should actually be able to do a wget. And by default, it's running on 8,000. And sure enough, so the application's up and running and working the way I expect. So let's uh, do this. So let's actually change uh, the configuration. Let's see if I can remember.
OK. So it looks like it worked. So let me run slog again. And you can see, sure enough, uh, you saw that git request that I made. And then you can see that the configuration recompiled, right? So what happened there is that I connected to the supervisor using that hab config apply command. And I injected a new configuration. And then the application or the supervisor detected it. It restarted the application. And now if I go and look on port 8000, what should I get? Nothing, right? So if I go to port 3000, you can see now the dynamic configuration happened. So if you can think of this in terms of if you're running containers, if you're running a whole bunch of different application instances, and you need to very quickly go and change um, uh, a setting like that, you can do it very easily by injecting it through the supervisor. So one last thing that I'll show you before we stop. We're bumping up against time here. So I need to do one thing. OK, so the other part that I want to show you is the actual uh, supervisor itself and just kind of show you some of the information you can get. Uh, so I can hit this, and you can see it's a bunch of JSON. So um, 9631 is the uh, API endpoint for querying it and getting information out. 9638 is what you would interact with uh, if you're um, going to be working with the gossip ring. So if I just pipe this through JQ, I'll get pretty printed uh, format. And so I can see information about where the application's running. You can see what version of uh, the Expresso application and also the build time. I can also see what version of Habitat I'm running in this case, the IP address. Uh, the other thing that you can see is the configuration as well. So there's that configuration. If I would have looked at this before I injected that new configuration, this would have been 8,000. You can also see the topology that you're running in and so forth. Uh, you can hit other endpoints as well. So if I do services, expresso, slash default, slash config, I get the actual, just the configuration itself. Um, so this is a very easy way for you to go and get information about the application and how the application runs. And then lastly, if I wanted to now take this application and export it as a Docker container, all I need to do is export it like this. And it will go and install everything that I need. Dependency-wise, it'll calculate that dependency tree, as I talked about. And then I can do a Docker run on that resulting container image that it's going to generate for me. So with that, what questions can I answer for you in the about five minutes we have left?